Hi there and welcome back to my channel. My name is Marianne and in this tutorial I will be walking you through the process of creating an oil painting of a client's childhood cottage. I wanted this painting to feel cozy and welcoming, like someone could be waiting at the front door of the cottage with a plate of fresh baked cookies. We're going to dive straight into the teaching since there's so much that I want to share with you. But before we get started, I'd love if you would take the opportunity to like, subscribe and comment on this video to help me continue to build this channel. Let's get started. To begin, we'll start by layering in the shadows and dark sections of the painting with a thin layer of burnt umber paint. Burnt umber dries nice and quickly, but I still add a hint of liquid to the paint to ensure I can work on top of it the following day. This simple layer allows the composition to come to life on the canvas and strengthens the drawing by making it easier to follow. From there, I'm going to start blocking in the painting by using large chunks of color to help flesh out the composition. I had some complex choices to make down the road, which I'll get into later, so eliminating all of the blank canvas as quickly as possible helps you make better informed decisions when you have to deviate from your reference photo. If you're watching this tutorial and are interested in learning more about oil painting, I've created a brand new ebook that you can download for free through the link in the description below. This painting was such an interesting commission to take on because the subject has such sentimental meaning for the client. This is her grandparents' cottage, but the building had received numerous changes over the years and she wanted the painting to show how it used to look instead of how it currently looks. So when we first began our discussions for the project, we wound up using a photograph with a composition that we both liked, but came up with a list of things to change, to turn the painting into a living memory that was accurate to her childhood. In addition to changing the shutters back to the original blue and eliminating some of the visual clutter from the painting, such as satellite dishes and wood piles, I would also adjust the season and bring back the maple's full orange foliage. This had ripple effects throughout the painting, which I'll share later on in this tutorial. As I'm blocking in the forest, I'm focusing on more of the earth tones and shadows, moving from dark to light. Since I'm planning to add fall colors, which will be vibrant and intense, starting with this muted layer helps me get a rough idea of where the various trees will be located. This, combined with the canvas that I toned using quinacridone nickel azo gold, kept the painting feeling nice and warm, which is so important in preserving the nostalgic feeling that I was aiming for. The cottage itself was a little challenging to block in, only because I felt like it was leaning too cool. One of the tricks I like to use when mixing my colors is to use the color picker or the eyedrop tool in Photoshop to isolate various colors in my reference photo. Even though the siding on this cottage is pure white, whites have undertones, as do shadows. The shadows were strongly blue, and the whites were pale gray leaning slightly orange. However, because of color context and how warm the background colors of the painting were, even the orange tinted whites seem cool by comparison. As I was finishing the cottage, I noticed that the greens in the foreground were starting to appear flat and dull, a phenomenon in oil painting known as sinking in. To fix this, I employed a technique called oiling out. To oil out my painting, I used a combination of Gamsol and Safflower oil, though there are numerous other combinations available. You'll need a mason jar or container to combine them, some measuring spoons, your mediums that you'll be combining to create the solution, a large brush to apply it with, and a lint-free cloth such as cheesecloth to wipe away the excess. To mix, I used a 3 to 1 ratio of Gamsol to Safflower oil, so 3 tablespoons of Gamsol with 1 tablespoon of Safflower. I added them to my mason jar and mixed them together before brushing them over the surface of the painting and wiping away the excess with the cheesecloth. This had an immediate effect on the painting and restored the luster of all the sunken in colours. 
the blue shutters were another modification that was made and required thinking about how a specific shade of blue would behave in both light and shadow. I was provided with a close-up photo of the door, which had remnants of the same shade of blue that used to be on the shutters, so I used Photoshop to sample and isolate that color of blue that was in both light and shadow. Then I used the reference photo to see where the light fell, and applied the darker blue in shadow and the lighter color in full sun. When you're modifying a reference photo, thinking about the ripple effects of every decision can be a real challenge, particularly when you're thinking about light and shadow. As an example, let's look at what happens when you add leaves to a tree that weren't there in your reference photo. Because I was anticipating foliage being added in later, I had already increased the shadows on the roof, placing them where I believed that they would fall, and I used some loose brushwork to conceal the fact that I was making them up as I went along. As such, after the foliage was added, it made sense within the broader context of the painting and it didn't look out of place. Another ripple effect of this decision was that I needed to add in more fall foliage behind the cottage. It wouldn't make sense to have only one tree remaining in full autumn glory while all the trees behind it were bare. So as I went through and added in the second layer, I restored all of the foliage on the trees adding in yellows and golds for the birches, some additional orange maples, and some hints of red to balance everything out. When I'm working with yellows and oranges, the painting can sometimes feel too acidic and difficult to look at, which is a strange way to describe it, but I'm hoping it makes sense. Reds and browns can help soften those colors and create a piece that feels more warm since it softens the visual impact and relaxes your gaze. As I was layering in the foliage, I noticed that a few of my blocked in trees were too chunky and looked like giant blobs against the sky. To make them look more natural, I mixed a color that was close enough to the sky and dabbed it in. When it comes to making adjustments in your painting, close enough is often okay, because the eye of your viewer will naturally soften and blend together colors that are extremely similar. In the midground were two large trees flanking the composition, an evergreen on the left and a maple on the right. I started with the maple and used rough, loose brush strokes to create the foliage. When painting trees, leaves tend to form clusters where they clump together at the end of a branch. I worked from the top to the bottom of the tree, starting with some green and brown toned shadows before working to the lightest and most vibrant colors on top. Keeping the same loose brushwork, I also added in some details underneath the trees, dappling highlights and shadows into the forest floor to build some depth. The large evergreen tree on the left was a bit more challenging because it dominated so much of the foreground, but I didn't want to make it too detailed, otherwise it could steal the focus away from the cottage. So again, I kept the brushwork soft, and instead of dabs like on the maple, flicked the brush to suggest a pine tree. I apologize for the glare on the paint from my lights during this section, but hopefully you're able to see the colors and shapes that were worked into the tree. From there, I added another layer onto the grass, brightening the greens, adding some highlights from the sun, dabbing in some oranges for fallen leaves, and touching up the shadows to make the shapes a little more clear. I know I'm repeating the word soft over and over throughout this tutorial, but it really is the key to creating a gentle, nostalgic painting. There are no harsh edges, everything is blended ever so slightly, and it allows the cottage itself to take center stage. Finally, once the majority of the painting had received its second layer, it was time to move on to the cottage. The first thing I did was to tape up the lines that I needed to be straightened. Once those were in place, I could move from left to right, slowly adding deeper shadows, hints of window panes, and other small details. 
Since this piece was a softer, more emotional painting, the lines in the window panes could have a sort of sketchy quality to them, and I wasn't worried about making them perfectly straight. However, any line that contributed actively to the perspective, such as the bottom of the cottage or the lines formed by the shadows, needed to be straightened out. The siding of the house presented another challenge because I was torn about trying to represent it. The thing about small, narrow siding is that it can come across too sharp if you try to paint every single line. I instead decided to allude to it in the shadows of the cottage, adding in a few horizontal lines in the darker areas to suggest that it was made of siding, and barely hinting of its presence in the highlighted areas. I used the same technique with the chimney, working in some variations of the red brick color, but never resorting to adding in every single mortar line. For the final steps, I went through the painting and marked all of the touch-up areas that I wanted to address with green tape. This is such a great strategy for keeping an eye on parts of the painting that need to be addressed, almost like putting a bookmark on the canvas. You'll see here that one of my last steps was to add in a chimney that I'd forgotten, that I basically had to sketch in with paint. It happens to the best of us, and even if you accidentally omit an important detail, you can always add it back in. And with that, this 18 by 24 inch painting is now complete. Thank you so much for following along with this tutorial, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to write me a comment below, and don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Instagram at Marianne Vanderdusen and on Facebook by searching Marianne Vanderdusen Visual Artist. You can also join my free Facebook Art Incubator support group through the link in the description below. Keep making your life beautiful, and I'll see you in the next video.